Hello, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 27 of Conceptual Physical Science, 6th edition. In this second chapter on astronomy, the second of three, we're going to talk about stars and galaxies. We have zoomed out from just talking about our solar system and the planets and moons and asteroids and comets that make up that solar system to talking about other solar systems indirectly because we're not going to focus on the study of exoplanets, which are these other worlds that orbit around their own stars, but instead talk about stars themselves, stars other than our sun. How do we classify stars? What is the life cycle of stars, which we'll briefly discuss? How, how do stars differ? Dramatically is the answer, and we'll certainly talk about that. And then eventually, how are stars grouped together in giant clouds or spiral structures called galaxies? And then some interesting facts about galaxies themselves, the role that they play in the structure of the universe as a whole, which then will set us up for our final chapter, chapter 28, when we'll talk about where the universe came from, or the theory for where the universe came from. I only chuckle because it's such a large question. But let's get to it. Let's talk about stars and galaxies, stars other than our sun. So we're going to start with talking about constellations a bit because the night sky is full of stars, and we want to get some idea about what we're looking at before we get into the science of what are stars made out of and so on. So we're going to talk about the night sky. Then we're going to talk about the brightness and color of stars. Because, again, that's a directly observable fact from the surface of Earth. So that's a good place where we start with our scientific exploration is with that brightness and color. All right. Then we'll get into something called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which, by the way, everyone calls the HR diagram. And really not exaggerating, the HR diagram is to astronomy as the periodic table is to chemistry, which is to say... The HR diagram is the astronomer's periodic table, okay? It's the wonderful single figure that tells us so much about the nature of stars and the many different types of stars that exist out there in the universe, like in our own galaxy. Then the life cycles of stars, which I mentioned, there's more than one life cycle a star can take. One eventual husk, leftover remnant, a dramatic type of it, which is the black hole. In other words, Black holes are where stars or what stars become when they die in certain cases. In fact, just the largest stars. But the very biggest stars, when they die, they become black holes. And by the way, we'll also discuss the other types of interesting remnants that stars leave behind when they stop operating as normal fusion burning stars. And then finally, galaxies, groupings of stars, but also interesting in their own right. What are the features that define galaxies? What are the physics that define galaxies? And what about the life cycle of galaxies, if we're talking about the life cycles? Okay? So, starting with the night sky. Imagine going out, having a very clear night sky. What do you see? Well, you see many constellations, which are groups of stars named over antiquity, right? They were named thousands of years ago. Familiar constellations include Ursa Major, all right? And here it is, also known as the Great Bear, okay? the Big Dipper. And we can see there is Ursa Major, which is just a connect the dots group of stars. There are many of these constellations. The monthly constellations seen in the night sky changes Earth's path around the sun progresses. So for example, when you have February right here, so the month of February, this is the location of Earth in February. Well, the constellation that is behind the sun in that month is the constellation that's associated with the zodiac or the zodiac calendar. So in that case, we would have a, depending on what type of, uh, what part of the month in February, we might have the constellation Pisces, or we would have the constellation Pisces at some point in February, and it'd be behind the sun. Now I point that out, the idea that that constellation is behind the sun in terms of its monthly significance, because we actually wouldn't see that constellation in the night sky, even though that is the constellation and the zodiac associated with certain days in February. That seems somewhat counterintuitive. The idea, of course, is that, or maybe, maybe not of course, but it can be understood that the idea was that in antiquity, the idea of the constellation being with the sun gave it special privilege. It gave it special significance. Even though you wouldn't see that constellation, you knew it was living with the sun, so to speak, during that time of the year. The only time, in fact, you would ever see that constellation in the month it's associated with, for example, Pisces in February, would be during a full solar eclipse because 
then the stars that would normally be obscured by the sun's light would be visible for a few minutes as this as the moon blocks out the sun's intense light okay but by the way in that time in that time of the year um, the actual constellations that you would see overhead in February would be the constellations associated with the zodiac of August so something like Leo you'd see the lion overhead in February okay so just an example about monthly constellations so can you see that during a solar eclipse, the darkened daytime sky would show the constellation positions as normally seen six months earlier or later, right? Because other than just being associated with the zodiac, it's also a six month difference because as I showed here, we're cutting exactly halfway across the circle. This entire, entire circle, the path of earth through space around the sun takes 12 months to complete. Half of course is six months. The Big Dipper, returning, or returning to that common constellation, is a well-known constellation. The pairs of stars at the end of its bowl point to Polaris, the North Star, which is very useful in the Northern Hemisphere, that we have this constellation that then points to the North, North Star so we can see where it is, because otherwise it can be easy to miss a single star, even though the North Star is a brighter star, not although not always the brightest star in the sky at that time. Okay, but anyway, the North Star. And here at our particular latitude in North America, the angle up to the North Star would be something on the order of 38 degrees because that is equal to our latitude above the equator. So in fact, the altitude in degrees to the North Star is always exactly equal to your northern latitude, okay? The seven stars of the Big Dipper are at very different distances from Earth. A truer statement has never been said, at least rarely. And this is so much of what astronomy is about that we directly observe these dots in the sky. We can measure their brightness and we can, me we can measure their spectra, their colors, and, and thus discern what elements they're made out of. And we talked about this when we talked about the understanding of the atomic model, all right, how, how electrons operate in atoms. But there's also this other question, this other mystery of astronomy, and that's that these stars are all so, at such great distances from each other and such great relative distances from us. For example, these stars, some of them are 93 light years away, the ones in the Big, Dip Big Dipper. Others are as far as 360 light years, all right? Over three times as far, about four times as far as the other star. Much further away, but the stars might appear the same brightness because they could be vastly different stars. One larger and hotter, or maybe about to die and thus burning hotter, or one smaller than our sun, but just particularly close. So this idea then, we need to dis determine exactly how far stars are because otherwise we have two bits of information that will not fit together. Their brightness that we measure from Earth and how far they actually are. But how, how do we know how far they actually are? Well, that's one of the great achievements of astronomy is having independent techniques of determining how far away stars actually are. Because it can't just be the brightness, okay? It cannot just be the brightness. A time exposure of the night sky shows streaks of stars from our carousel of Earth. Stars appear to rise and set, or stars that never rise and set, which are circumpolar, stars that take a circular path over the duration of a night. All right, for example, the North Star, of course, would never rise or set. It just remains fixed in a fixed location. It makes a tiny circle, depending on how accurately you measure it. But stars around the North Star are the very ones that are so-called circumpolar, right? But other stars would just rise in the east and set some point in the west, okay? Well, that of course isn't their actual motion relative to Earth, but instead just is just the apparent motion of these stars because Earth is spinning about its own axis and that's the view of space that we get when it's nighttime and the sun isn't washing out all the stars or you know so bright that we can't see the stars. Furthermore, the stars do move, of course, but their motion is very, very tiny relative to us, because although the galaxy is a swirling mass of stars, which we'll talk about more, and these stars are moving relative to each other and moving relative to the center of the galaxy, that motion happens on such a long time scale that it's not something that we actually can measure, except, except in extreme cases, here from Earth. So stars appear to be fixed in place, always fixed in place, all right? Although, of course, they are moving at hundreds of thousands of kilometers relative to, say, the center of the galaxy. So, Knowing the names of the constellations tells us much about what? The stars that comprise them, the people and the cultures that name them, the difference between the stars and the planets, or all of the above. 
So what, how important are knowing the names? Well, it's really just the, it's just the history. It's just the cultural history. The names have no scientific significance. We still use the name because we need to group stars together and it's convenient for scientists to refer to stars that are in a particular constellation because we know where to look. But they don't, their names don't have any scientific meaning. Now, again, back to this idea, the stars we observe from Earth. Well, what can we measure directly? What do we, if we just look at this, this little dot in the sky, what can we measure? Well, we can measure its color. Its color is directly related to its temperature. We talked about this way back in one of our chapters on physics. This is known as Wien's Law, actually. And it tells us that a dense body like a, a star has a direct correlation between surface temperature and color. So that's one of the greatest achievements of astronomy is immediately knowing how hot stars are. Okay. Now, what we know is that a red star is cooler and blue stars are hotter, okay? Higher energy light, blue light means a hotter star, all right? A blue star is in fact almost twice as hot as a red star. The blue light has almost twice the frequency of the red light in accordance with Wien's law right here, mathematically shown as a proportionality just between the frequency of the light, okay? Remember, light's a wave, and the temperature of the star that created that light. And this applies to more than just stars, but right here, of course, we care about stars, okay? So which of these stars radiates light of the longest wavelength? Red stars, yellow stars, blue stars, or violet stars. And these all exist, by the way. Violet stars are stars that are so hot that their peak wavelength isn't even blue. So which is it? Which is the longest wavelength? Okay. Well, what you need to remember here is the following, that the speed of light is wavelength, represented by the Greek letter lambda, times frequency. And the speed of light is always the same. It's always a constant. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, okay, that's the speed of light. If that's a constant, then, well, there's, that means that if you know lambda, you also know f. In other words, if you know wavelength, you also know frequency, or vice versa. And if your frequency is high, your wavelength must be low, and vice versa, and vice versa, okay? So that means that red stars, which have the lowest frequency because they're the coolest, must have the longest wavelength. So, we measure the brightness of a star in two ways. It's apparent brightness, that's the brightness as it appears to us, and it's luminosity, which is the intrinsic brightness independent of how bright it appears. Okay, well, apparent brightness is a direct observation. Luminosity requires that great achievement of astronomy to know how far the star actually is. Okay, we need to know distance to get from apparent brightness to luminosity. We know distance. Now, we can't send a probe out to determine how far a star actually is. We can't bounce you know, a radio wave off it or even a, a laser ray off of a star to determine how far away it is. It's, it's just too far away. We actually have to use these very fascinating independent techniques to determine distance. We have to understand space. And, there, and that, again, there's, this has to do about certain types of stars that, that emit or pulsate and then that pulse rate is, is directly tied to the luminosity that tells us the true luminosity of the star. And then from there we can measure distance and then find other stars near it. So then we know all their distances. So it's, it's a whole work, it's an intricate work to determine distance. But once we have distance, we can go from apparent brightness directly measured on earth to true luminosity, which is really a measure of how much energy that star is putting out. Okay, so very, very fascinating there. We measure the sun's luminosity in this, this quantity right here, L sun. So we use it as a baseline. That way we can talk about the luminosity of other stars as multiples of how bright they are compared to our star. And by bright, I mean how much energy they output, their true brightness. So if we were on a spaceship twice as far from the sun, its apparent brightness would appear the same, half as much, one quarter as much, or four times as much. Now this is a tricky one if you don't remember the inverse square law. But if you do, then you, you're in good shape because luminosity is proportional to one over distance from the source squared. That's an inverse square law. There are other things that follow the inverse square law. Remember, static electric, electric force, Coulomb's law, and the gravitational force also follow, follow this inverse square law, but so does luminosity, okay? Now here it is, the periodic table of astronomy, but not literally, it's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's a name for this very important diagram. It's a graph of the intrinsic brightness, that's the true brightness, intrinsic just means you know, in, inherent or true to the star, versus the surface temperature, right? Because we know that directly from Wien's law for stars. Right? So the amazing, amazing relationship here. Notice the axes. They're exactly the, the ideas we just mentioned. So luminosity, all right? 
compared to the sun, so a star that has a luminosity of one on this version of the HR diagram would be exactly as much power output as our sun, okay? So, and that's the same wattage as our sun, all right? So that means our sun would exist exactly at that point, okay? Now the surface temperature of the sun, due to its color, happens to be, we just draw a vertical line here, happens to be just over 6,000 Kelvin, okay? Actually, uh, this, this says it's in degrees, so let's double check. Yeah, I guess this is in degrees Celsius, okay? Not Kelvin. The, these graphs are often represented in Kelvin as well, but here we see degrees, and Kelvin is never represented in degrees, so that, well, that should give us that this is in degrees Celsius. So here we have that the sun is about 6,000 degrees Celsius, okay? By the way, there's usually not a big difference between using Celsius and Kelvin for things this hot, because the only difference is 273, okay, to, tra to transfer from Kelvin to Celsius. So if you, the difference then between a 10,000 degree star and a 10,200 degree star isn't that much, okay? All right, but anyway, our sun is not 10,000 degrees Celsius. It's, again, just, um, I said just over, but it's actually just under 6,000 degrees Celsius. The reason that I misread it is because I always forget, or not always, but it's easy to forget, that this bottom axis, this horizontal axis, is quite unusual because it gets larger as we move to the left, okay? Now, typically, values get larger as we move to the right. We read from left to right. But due, due to the historical way this graph was composed, the values, as, as you should note, get larger as we move to the left. And by larger, I mean higher temperature in degrees Celsius, okay? All right, so that's our sun right there. Notice our sun is in this group. That's what these clouds represent, a way of classifying stars together in important groupings, a group called the main sequence, okay? These are stars that have hydrogen fusion in their cores. These are stars, the most of the stars in the universe, most of the stars around our sun, most of the stars in the galaxy, most of the stars in other galaxies are main sequence stars, okay? When very large main sequence stars, again, hydrogen fusion stars, begin to die, they become supergiants, and they begin, they begin to fuse heavier elements, which is unsustainable, and the stars eventually start you know, becoming much larger, much cooler, okay, but also brighter. Okay, so their brightness actually increases, or at least slightly, right? We can see it's almost horizontal in luminosity, okay? On the other hand, stars like our sun, when they die and start fusing some heavier elements, not as, not as many heavier elements, because they're not massive enough to overcome the repulsive force between these atomic nuclei, but a star like our sun will also swell in size, cool off, and become noticeably brighter, because notice that there is a substantial increasing in the vertical values, all right, for stars like our sun, so stars in that category of luminosity and thus temperature, because the two values are tied together on the main sequence, okay? It's almost like a linear relationship between surface temperature and luminosity and this 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 right here, right, in the main sequence, this little, almost this line that cuts down. But anyway, we're talking about stars like our sun dying. They become giants, and as they do that, their luminosity increases. Okay, showing it goes up in luminosity. It becomes maybe a hundred times, so 10 squared, or a hundred times brighter right before it finally completely dies. And we'll talk briefly about what, what happens when a, a star like our sun does completely die, okay? There's also this grouping of white dwarfs. These are actually leftover husks of dead stars. So a star like our sun, after it becomes a giant, blows off its upper layers. Again, we'll, we'll touch on that again, but then it will then cool off over hundreds of millions of years and then become a white dwarf and it will remain that white dwarf for almost ever, much longer than the current age of the universe for tens of billions of years, it will just remain a white dwarf slowly cooling off over time, but no longer fusing anything, okay? White dwarfs are not, are, are, they're dead stars. There's no fusion going on in their core, okay? So note that the positions that form a main sequence, okay, we brought, talked about that, for average stars, because most stars are in the main sequence, Hydrogen fusion, again, is the definition of main sequence, right? And exotic stars above or below the main sequence, because most stars aren't white dwarfs, and most stars aren't giants, because giants is just a short short span in the life of a star. And when we say most stars aren't white dwarfs, that there's some bias there because they're harder to discover, but also there hasn't been enough time for that many stars to die, okay? Especially in our particular galaxy. The HR diagram is to an astronomer what the periodic table is to a chemist. To say that again, okay? So. On the HR diagram, the sun is an average star. Is it seen to be special? Is it a low temperature star? Or is it especially bright? Which did you take away, right?
Well, the sun's kind of right there in the middle, isn't it? Right? So it's an average star. It's an average star right, right because it's in the middle of the main sequence. And even the fact that it's in the main sequence at all, at all makes it an average star. So it is a it is a very average star. There, there are, it's a common type of star in the galaxy. Okay, a dying star that has collapsed to a small size and is cooling off would appear in which part of the HR diagram? I mentioned this briefly. Which part? Lower left, upper left, lower right, or upper right? Now remember, it's the lower left. That's where white dwarfs are. Okay. So. Let's briefly talk about the life cycle of stars. So before we talked about in the, the model of the solar system, how a nebula collapses to become a, a, you know, a spinning disk of matter, the very center of that spinning disk of matter, by far the densest part of the, the nebula that collapsed into a spinning disk is the protostar, okay? And then we talked about how the remnants of, you know, around the protostar become all the planets and the asteroids and the comets and so on, right? But here we care about the protostar, right? Come, came from a condensing, Increasing, increasing in rotation cloud, right? And that process, by the way, takes tens to tens of millions to billions of years, depending on how big the nebula was to begin with. It becomes a star when the fusion in its core occurs. And by fusion, the fusion that begins with every protostar and continues as long as that star is on the main sequence is always hydrogen to helium fusion. Not one-to-one -one like this, but in general, the element hydrogen to the element helium, okay? That's the type. And there's actually different types of hydrogen and helium fusion. Some sort of almost have a catalyst if we're using a chemical analogy. But the, the point is it's always hydrogen becoming helium. Okay? And that happens for most of the lifespan of stars. By the way, the lifespan of stars varies dramatically. Stars that are up here on the main sequence only stay there for tens of millions of years. So we'll say 10 to the 7 years. Whereas stars that are smaller and cooler than our own sun, so the smallest, reddest stars in the main sequence, will stay there for hundreds of billions of years. So much, much longer. Okay? There are some stars that only last for hundreds of thousands of years, in extreme cases, on the very burn hot, die young stars. Okay? Whereas on the other hand, burn cooler live for you know, many billion years. That's the smaller stars. Depending on its mass, the star, this is our back to the life cycle, may become a red giant, then burn out to become a white dwarf. Okay? What stars do that? Smaller mass stars become red giants and then white dwarfs. Okay? Smaller mass stars on the smaller end, this is the lower half of the main sequence. Okay? And smaller always means less luminosity. Okay? So there's a, although size didn't directly show up on the two axes of the HR diagram, it's tied in with luminosity. Okay? Our, our star, our sun, falls into this category. We'll become a red giant and then a white dwarf, okay? A white dwarf will cool for eons. By eons, we mean tens or hundreds of billions of years until, until it's so cold that it just doesn't emit light anymore and it becomes some sort of giant exotic crystal the size of a planet. If part of a binary, it can actually get pulled apart. It can pull matter, well, it can explode, but it pulls matter because it's so much denser. It's the leftover core, after all, of a star, right? It pulls matter off of its neighbor. It will gradually, and there are lots of examples of this happening. Many, many cases where there is a two-star system, binary star systems make up half of known star systems, at least in our own galaxy. And these white dwarfs, these dead leftover stars, in when there is one in a binary system, which isn't all binary systems, but there are some that have a white dwarf in them, it, we see them often pulling matter off of the main sequence star. That causes effects to the main sequence star, kind of will, will in some cases pull it off of the main sequence, but it can create this nuclear blast on the surface of the white nova, or on the surface of the white dwarf called the nova. Okay, and this is a flash of light. The final stages of more massive stars is to collapse in an explosion called a supernova, right? So this is a massive explosion. Stars like our own sun will never have a supernova. They'll have something called a planetary nebula where they'll gradually lose mass off the top um, layers of the sun when it is a red giant. But the process then of becoming a white dwarf is, is gradual, not, um, not cataclysmic, not a giant explosion. But stars much bigger than our own sun, stars that are, say, 10 times bigger, or 10 times more massive than our own sun, will have a dramatic end in a supernova. Supernovas can be seen here. So a remnant of a supernova in the Crab Nebula, we can see how it's affected and energized all of the, um, the gases that around that section of space. All right? And the supernova can spread out over light years, given enough time. The source of energy in the sun and stars is what? 
Is it chemical reactions? Is it thermonuclear reactions? Or is it both? Well, it's a good one to make sure you're clear on it. It's absolutely thermonuclear. It is a fusion reaction. It occurs in the nucleus of atoms. Okay? So, fun size comparison here. We'll spend a couple slides on this. This ties back in nicely with the previous chapter when we were talking about planets quite a bit. Right here we have the small terrestrial planets like Earth shown here. This would be Earth and the Moon to scale. All right, Earth and the Moon. We have Jupiter, the largest of the planets in our, in our solar system. And we can see then how much bigger the Sun is, certainly you know, dramatically bigger than the Earth, and even you know, noticeably, or I'd say maybe dramatically bigger than Jupiter, right? And Jupiter is huge by planet standards, okay? But the Sun is not a very large star. What do I mean by that? Well, consider a main sequence star like Vega. All right, Vega is a very large main sequence star, which means it's burning blue and hot, and it's not going to live that long in the main sequence. But it's still a main sequence star, hydrogen fusion. Okay, well, turns out Vega though doesn't compare at all to dying stars. If we look at dying stars like Arcturus and Alpha Ceti, well, these stars, Arcturus is actually a very bright star in the sky. Alpha Ceti isn't so much because it's so far away. But both these stars are massive because they're dying. They're, they're basically cooling off and their pressure is decreasing. Their outer layers are expanding, okay? They're expanding as the core is collapsing in, in on itself, which is quite fascinating. But as the core is collapsing, the outer layers are expanding and these stars become massive and very bright. And look at how much more massive they are than a already massive star like Vega. And to, to bring home the idea, the sun would just be a small black dot in comparison to these massive stars. But there are even bigger stars out there such as Betelgeuse, which is a hypergiant, right? Or a supergiant, hypergiant, depending on how it's classified. This was a star like Vega that started to die, all right? Or maybe a star that even started, started off a little bit hotter than Vega, a star that was so, so hot and burned so bright that it only lasted for a few hundred thousand years and emitted most of its light in the ultraviolet spectrum. Well, when it begins to die, its outer layers expand dramatically and we get a star as big as Betelgeuse, all right? A red supergiant. But Betelgeuse is one of the brightest stars in the sky, but there are other stars that are much further away that have been discovered by sophisticated telescopes that are even bigger than Betelgeuse, like Cephei A. All right? Point being, there are some unbelievably massive stars out there. The sun doesn't even show up as a pixel in this case. Right? So all these stars are within 3,000 light years of Earth, which means they are our immediate neighborhood within the Milky Way galaxy, all right? 3,000 light years is compared to the entire Milky Way galaxy. Well, we'll talk about my galaxies in a second, but the Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So LY for light years. So you can see then that 3,000 is about 3% of the overall diameter of this disc-shaped galaxy. Now, after that supernova of, of you know, the biggest stars, what's sometimes left behind is a black hole. This is the remains when a supergiant star collapses in on itself, the core collapses in on itself, the core of the star, the outer layers blow away. Named because, uh, because gravitation at surface is so intense that even light cannot escape. If you've heard the idea of escape speed, we have a certain escape speed here on Earth. It's around 6,000 meters per second, all right, in order to escape, escape Earth. Um, oh, excuse me, that's, that's to achieve an orbit. To escape Earth, it's actually on the order of 12,000 meters per second. But in some cases, if you have something that's much more massive than Earth, that escape velocity can go up so fast that the escape velocity, we'll call it VE, right? That's for Earth. Well, what if VE equals the speed of light? What if it's 300 million meters per second, three times 10 to the eight meters per second, the speed of light? Well, in that case, light itself can't escape and you have a black hole. And since light is the only means of carrying information in the universe, nothing escapes the black hole. Well, except for gravitational waves, maybe. And this is a recent discovery, you know, forefront of physical research, we're discovering that gravitational waves themselves carry energy and travel at the speed of light. And they kind of do escape black holes, or at least when black holes collide with other black holes. But light certainly cannot. All right? So why gravitation at the surface of a star increases when it collapses is because you have the same amount of mass in a smaller volume. So when a star collapses to one-tenth its size, the gravitation at its surface becomes what? One-tenth as much, the same, 10 times as much, or 100 times as much? Well, it's proportional to the square, so it's 100 times as much. One-tenth the size, 100 times the gravity. You can see 
gravitational force goes way up as size decreases dramatically. So when a giant star collapses to become a black hole, gravity is greatly increased at its surface, at its center, in all the surrounding space, or everywhere. Well, not at its center. In fact, the gravity would cancel out at its center. It's only at its surface, all right? Now, the gravity would also be large as you moved away, but it would only decrease with distance. It wouldn't be all surrounding space. It'd be inversely proportional to how far away you are, but its surface would be where the gravity would be noticeable. Again, zero at its center. If the sun collapsed to become a black hole, which isn't going to happen, the orbit of Earth would what? Remain unchanged, be pulled inward towards the black hole, because we hear about black holes eating stars, spiral outward away from the black hole, because the black hole can no longer hold on to the star, or just be a straight line path. Well, in fact, unchanged, because we'd be sufficiently far from the black hole that there would be no significant tidal forces on Earth, and we'd just continue to orbit around the black hole. Of course, without any life giving energy coming from the sun, life supplying energy, we would just become a cold, you know, ice ball of a planet, but we would continue to orbit around the black hole. Now, if a planet like Earth or Mercury, say, was much closer to a black hole, then the tidal forces could be great enough that the planet then can get pulled apart. As it gets pulled apart, then it as and then thus loses energy, then due to conservation of energy, it then spirals inwards towards the black hole, eventually crossing what's known as the event horizon. And then where all information is lost because light can't escape. But point being that only happens if there are significant tidal forces. Now that does happen between stars and black holes and that's how stars can fall into black holes over time. But again, that would not happen to Earth because it's sufficiently far away, okay? Now, stars are grouped into galaxies. On smaller scales, we have clusters of stars that we didn't discuss, but most importantly, clusters being less important, galaxies, top ID in astronomy, that stars are clustered in galaxies. Now these clusters are huge, massive, huge assemblies. There are around a hundred billion, okay, a hundred billion stars per galaxy. Okay, well that's a hundred million. We have a hundred billion, all right, stars per galaxy. Okay, hundred billion, thousands, all right, or hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, 100 billion stars per galaxy, okay? That's a lot of stars per galaxy, but that's that's what that's what an average size galaxy is. There are smaller galaxies, there are bigger. Our, our galaxy is, again, a typical galaxy, as far as we can tell, just like our sun is a typical star, and it has around 100,000 stars, all right? Now, there are three types of galaxies, big different types, which also have to do with their age relative to the Big Bang, more on the Big Bang in the next chapter, those are elliptical galaxies, irregular, and spiral, all right? Here shown is a giant elliptical galaxy. If you've seen pictures of galaxies, you might, you might think of them as having, maybe being more beautiful or well-defined than, well defined than this example. This is, seems like a hazy fog here, and that's because elliptical galaxies are just big clouds of stars. The stars in elliptical galaxies tend to be red, those longer-lived, cooler types of stars. There's not a lot of short-living blue stars because the galaxy doesn't support the continual growth of short-lived blue stars. So whatever there were originally are gone now in the life cycle of the galaxy. So they just look like clouds on the redder side. Their light tends to be more red, okay? Here are a pair of irregular galaxies, the large Me Magellanic Cloud and the neighboring small Magellanic Cloud, okay? These are regular galaxies, also sometimes called dwarf galaxies in, in more modern nomenclature. And sometimes these are just because they're small, and sometimes it's because they're sort of primordial galaxies, some of the first that ever formed. But in the case of the Magellanic Clouds, these are just small clouds near our own galaxy. By the way, on a collision course with our galaxy, and here's a spiral galaxy. Spiral galaxies are what me people usually first think of when they think of galaxies. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is a spiral galaxy. This, this one here is NGC 6744, and it's thought to be much like our Milky Way. We can uh, never see our Milky Way because it would take an unbelievable amount of time, even traveling at the speed of light, to actually get a bird's eye view of our own galaxy like this. But we can gather that our galaxy might look like this to an observer from another galaxy. All right? And galaxies, however, are not the largest things in the universe. There are clusters of galaxies themselves. And then there are galaxy superclusters, almost tendrils of clusters that are so large, it's so expansive that it's hard to even imagine the scale. All right? So some galaxies are known as active galaxies and are emitting huge amounts of energy. Our 
own galaxy, the Milky Way is not in that category. Perhaps it's younger galaxies that are active galaxies. That's one prevailing theory. But by comparison, these active galaxies emit many orders of magnitude more energy than our own Milky Way. So that means they're, they're emitting 1,000, 10,000, sometimes even 100,000 times more light than our galaxy, even though there's just as many stars. That's because there's just so much going on at the core of that galaxy, right? And these fall into get, cat, the categories of starburst galaxies and what, galaxies that have an active galactic nucleus. Let's break that down a little bit. A starburst galaxy is where there's a very high rate of star formation. This results from some violent disturbance, often a collision between two galaxies, because this happens a lot. Now, in comparison, stars almost never collide into each other other than in binary star systems, and that's more of, as we talked about, a white dwarf pulling matter off another star. But individual stars just don't collide into each other because there's so much empty space in between stars. Galaxies, however, are close to each other. One galaxy may just be a galaxy length to its neighboring galaxy. So given enough time, a few billion years, these galaxies tend to get gravitationally pulled towards each other, and then one crashes into the other, or they spiral and dance around each other as the gravity tugs on all these, these clusters of stars. And this phenomenon then can lead to starburst galaxies. All right? So this image here shows the aftermath of a collision of two spiral galaxies. The area in blue are the regions of rapid star formation. So we have huge areas of rapid star formation, a lot of energy coming out of there. Blue is associated with those short-lived, very massive stars. Those short-lived, very, short very massive stars are being created in large numbers like this because gas is getting condensed together and thus allowed to collapse in the protostars, very large protostars at that. Okay. Now, there's also some active galaxies that have supermassive black holes at their center. This is the prevailing theory. All right. These black holes are as massive as an entire solar system. In comparison, if our sun became a black hole, it, became, it would become a black hole around the size of our moon just tiny if you think about it. But these black holes are so large that they're as big as the orbit of Neptune. Think about how many suns it would take to make a black hole that big. Because the idea is as black holes continue to have matter fall into them, they feed on matter, they become larger and larger, okay? At least that's one understanding of these of supermassive black holes. And a lot of galaxies, most galaxies, as far as we know, have them at their centers but some are dormant like our own galaxy. Yes, dormant, They're not, not a lot of matter is entering them. Thus, not a lot of energy is being created on the edges. Now again, black holes don't emit energy because light can't escape them, but as, as matter accelerates towards the periphery of the black hole, the edge or event horizon of the black hole, it does emit energy during that acceleration and a lot of energy at that. So black holes are surrounded by a rim of energy, even though there's no energy coming from them themselves. All right, but this set, this process, this ring of energy around a supermassive black hole, creates an active galactic nucleus called an AGN. These produce unbelievable amounts of energy. All right, they create jets that extend thousands of light years into space. Again, remember galaxies themselves are are a hundred thousand light years across or smaller, right, or slightly larger. But these jets themselves can be ten thousand light years long, just from a single black hole. But again, a black hole the size of a solar system. Okay. And these, these active cores or as active centers of galaxies produce huge amounts of energy, all right? even more than starburst galaxies. The motion of individual stars in a galaxy normal fo normally follows what? The elliptical orbits around the center, completely random paths, straight lines, or circular orbits around the center, okay? Well, most elliptical orbits, okay? Not exactly circular, more common elliptical, all right? Now, especially, this is a good best answer here because remember, circ a circle is just a special case of an ellipse. It's an ellipse of zero eccentricity. So elliptical is the better term. It's the more encompassing term, all right? So the Milky Way galaxy and its neighboring galaxies are known as the local group. We know quite a bit about this local group of galaxies because it's close by, easy to study, and very interesting to astronomers. Okay, so we can see the Milky Way is one of the major galaxies in the local group. The other most major galaxy is Andromeda, and then the other is Triangulum. The Milky Way is on a crash course with Andromeda. Andromeda, because it's significantly more massive than the Milky Way, will essentially consume the Milky Way and eventually become a galaxy, perhaps a starburst galaxy, in about three, well, two and a half billion years from now, which is well within the lifespan of the, or continued lifespan of our own sun. Our sun will still be on the main sequence. That means that in a couple billion years, the sun will be very much like it is today, but the night sky should be dramatically different due to the 
rapid changing of stars as the two galaxies collide. All right, so humans probably won't be around then, but it's fascinating to think about how the night sky will change. Our local group is situated between the Virgo and Eridanus clusters, which all together make up the local supercluster. So this is getting the idea that galaxies themselves are clustered together. We can see the local group shown here on a very small scale is part of these much larger clusters of galaxies. Okay, the reasons why galaxies are clustered is an open field of uh, research, but perhaps dark matter is an explanation. Now, um, local superclusters like the one we just showed are part themselves of these chains of superclusters, which I referred to earlier almost like tendrils. They also look kind of like neurons if we use our imagination, neurons in the brain of an animal. And they stretch across the known universe. Okay, so the universe appears to be a network of superclusters, all created by some single physical phenomenon that we assume is the Big Bang, and that there are some pretty compelling direct evidence that there had to be some single event that created the universe, such as the microwave background radiation that leads us there. But what we see today are these tendrils of superclusters. All right, zooming out even more, you can see that these, these paths, these tendrils, continue out over the known universe. And it's taken a huge amount of research and computational power to collect data sets that create figures like the one shown here. All right. There are also large voids, by the way, where there are no galaxies. OK, so big gaps between galaxies. Perhaps you can see a few of them here in the image. Right. Will those eventually get filled with galaxies? Well, we'll yet to know. And that concludes our discussion on stars and galaxies. That only leaves our final discussion on the nature of space and time itself, starting with the Big Bang and trying to wrap together a lot of ideas. I hope this has been a fun lecture and a fun near end to our journey through the physical sciences. Thank you so much for watching.